Okay, good morning, folks. The really wordy title we'll get to in a little bit. For the most part, I want to start by saying thanks and sorry. Um, and thanks mainly because it's early in the morning and normally, like, I try to avoid keynotes because they not as meaty and there's an old person either trying to sell you stuff or trying to give you advice that's slightly outdated. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks a lot for coming. I've seen lots of talks in my time, seen a few keynotes, and most of them pretty routinely were garbage. Um, so <laughs> I'm setting a low bar. Someone before the talk told me the secret to life is to set a low bar. Um, yeah, so so most keynotes are generally garbage, and and part of the reason is we are talking about it like it's a quirk that you start getting invited for keynotes when you're old enough that what you do no longer matters as much. So you kind of make sure that the person keynoting just doesn't have the right amount of experience for you. But like there's that old sunscreen song that says giving advice is a form of nostalgia. So the person giving it to you thinks more of it, and it's kind of all of you to kind of take it. So thanks. Um, and the, I want to say sorry, because you'd already have noticed I say a lot. Sometimes I repeat myself. And the repeating myself, mainly I mean, if you've ever watched one of my other talks or ever heard parts of it, there's some things that I say a lot, some topics that we talk about a lot. And it's not just because we're lazy. In part, it's because it's the stuff we believe in. And, and so that doesn't change too much from day to day. And we end up talking about it a fair bit. The other thing is that I use a lot of quotes in my talk. And mainly, that's because I'm lazy. And quoting other people just means that you don't have to actually think for yourself. For this keynote, the, the last thing I want to say sorry for up front is that some of it will sting. Um, and, and mainly some of it will sting because in part, like, that's what the morning talk is for. Like, other people will give you actual practical stuff that you can verify. I'm going to give you hand wavy stuff that you can't hold me to. But almost every time I've gotten useful advice uh, on someone, it did sting a little because you wouldn't have been doing doing it the wrong way if you didn't think it was right. And and when somebody nudges you, it stings. And and so I guess the first quote that I'll use or the first URL that I'll refer to is if you get one of those things that sting, give it five minutes. Um and and this was actually a blog post that Jason Freed from Thirty Seven Signals had put out a while back, and he's got this really interesting story where he went, he went to a talk that someone gave. Someone said something that he felt was egregiously wrong, and after the talk, he goes during Q and A and he immediately pounces on the guy like, "You said this, and this is why you're wrong, and you didn't think about that." And he says the speaker looked at him and said, "Man, give it five minutes." Like, like, let it settle. And, and he's got this whole post about it that's, that's worth reading. But he says, look, like the speaker spent time thinking about it. He spent time putting this thing together. And what he was doing was instantly reacting to it and instantly figured out why the guy was wrong. And, and sometimes, like, it's worth just giving it five minutes just to think about it. If nothing else, it gives me a chance to leave the room. I guess one of the things that is a perfectly reasonable question is uh, why you should bother listening to me. There's no very good answer to that. For the most part, I've been really lucky in my career. So I got to play in a bunch of different spaces, um, spent a bunch of time with the other two old guys in front, hacking on stuff um, in the early 2000s. Like we broke into things all over. I spent a small stint CISOing, and now we've got a company that builds security software. And, and for the most part, the only reason that applies here is because I've been lucky enough to be a part of doing research that, that played internationally or building products that sell internationally. 
and and if not just from my experience like i've got to see people i worked with and so you can tell or or you get to tell like here's the sort of person who does work that becomes first class research or here's someone who builds a product that that has legs and for the most part that's my early appeal to authority that says i've worked with some of these people and i can kind of tell the difference and this is what i've noticed um so what's the talk about you should be really afraid because we're five minutes in and I'm just getting to that now. Um, but that's the point of the keynote and I'll ramble a little bit. For the most part, I'm going to share some links. So even if my talk is complete garbage, you get some links that you should take away and read. Um, and what I want to talk about is why so few cybersecurity products make it from South Africa into the world. So Intersect is one of them, and that's cool. Did my bit for the sponsors. There you go. Um, but um, uh, there's still shockingly few of them. And, and if you take security research, some of our stuff has made it to the world stage, but not a lot. And, and there's lots of us. And cybersecurity is not that new in South Africa. Like, we've got people who've been doing it for decades now. And, and the numbers are still surprisingly low. And the question is why. Um, I'll start with why we don't make great software or great software companies. And, and one of the things that should be obvious is if you were a student graduating from our universities today, you're in the same position as a student graduating from MIT or Caltech. Like we've got the same internet, the same laptops, we're building on the same AWS. We've got access to the same open courseware. But for some reason, people leave MIT and want to start Google and Facebook, and people leave our universities and want to work at one of the big audit houses. Like, like that thing just puts us on a different trajectory, where our best want to work at a company. At best, they end up at a bank doing Java web interfaces. Um, and so part of the question is why? And, and the moment you ask this question, again, I think it's just one of those things that's empirically true, right? We don't have that many software companies. And, and there are other products that need lots of investments, but software doesn't, which is interesting because if this topic ever comes up, one of the first things people go to is that South Africa doesn't have great software companies because we lack good VC ecosystem. And like I've got strong thoughts about venture capital and why most of it is pretty terrible for the security industry. But even if you look historically, you'll see lots of great companies didn't do huge amounts of VC raises. Like Apple at three million, MailChimp raised nothing and they're currently worth billions. So, so venture capital on its own is not the reason why we are or aren't making great software. And, and the answer is almost tautological. We don't make software because we don't make software. Like it's just not something we get used to doing. And, and what you'll see, and I've been ranting about this for many years, is that in South Africa, we end up becoming a nation of consumers. Like by default, we think that software is there for us to use. We use these big companies. It's just not something that we put together. And what's worse about it is it's not just that we end up thinking that we can't do it. We start to think that all the people around us can't do it. And it's, it's interesting. Like, like I know Intersect and we've worked with them from way back. But I can tell you as a local software company, even at my previous, at the previous security company that we had, most of our customers by far were international. When, when we built Things Canary, we didn't sell much of it locally at all. We did no local sales. We sold internationally. And then some local customers happened to come along, like the big banks and the large financials. And in part, it's because locally, people judge local software differently how internationally they judge software. 
one of the joys of, of Silicon Valley is the way they've embraced failure, okay? And if, if you take the average, like walk down any street in Silicon Valley and you'll find their coffee shop is trying out a new access control method, a new way for people to try paying for their coffees. And you'll see lots of terrible, terrible products, right? Like if you remember Twitter and how it sucked in its early days. And the difference is if something like that comes out from a South African company, lots of us will be the first to tear that product down and talk about how junk it is, okay? And the truth is all software is junk. Like if, if you look at reports of software on early Teslas, like people were literally SSHing into devices and controlling onboard computers. And, and when this whole kerfuffle happens, a very famous security dude, Mudge, who's even older than the guy in the front here, um, Mudge stood up and said, look, that's how software happens. Like, like that's, it's messy and, and that's what happens. And in South Africa, we kind of lack compassion for our people building that kind of software. We tear it down very quickly. And in the end, what it means is that nobody here does it. Um, instead, we just use the international stuff. And, and for this, you can get all biblical um, because that talks about no prophet is accepted in his hometown. But, but it's a little bit um, more than that. W when it comes to local software, there's a genuine feeling that locals can't do it. And, and with all evidence to the contrary, but, but the worst part is it creates this horrible loop, right? Where our best then leave because they can't build software here. And then what you left with is people who can't build software. And then when they try building software, it's terrible. And you get to say, look, the software is terrible. Why should we pay for that? Um, and one of the solutions for it is just that we need to build more stuff. We need to get used to people building more stuff. For those of you who remember FTP, you slightly date yourself, but, but everyone who was using FTP for a while was using WUFTP. And, and WUFTP was literally Washington University FTP. And, and if you wanted to practice on a memory corruption bug class, you could just do it on WFTP because chances are they made that mistake. But lots of people went to that university and cut their teeth building that software and learned how to actually ship real software. And if I had to ask you what software South African universities have shipped in the last few years, um, I don't know about you, but I'd be hard pressed to answer anything. And, and again, with all of this stuff, you see there's the cycle. Um, you see the universities and government have a part to play. Government needs to give projects like this to fledgling software companies. If, if you look historically, you'll see young Oracle cut its teeth building databases for the government. Like that's how that stuff happened. But nobody in this room controls that. And, and so for the most part, I think what the people in this room need to get used to is being less judgmental. Now, I'm, I'm not saying this so that we can start having sucky software products. I'm saying it so that we can start having software products. And with iteration, software products that suck today will hopefully suck a little less and eventually start getting better. But if nothing else, you should watch Ratatouille just for Anton Ego's speech, um, the, the new needs friends. Um, unless you're dealing with cryptocurrencies, in which case they need no friends and it should all be burnt to the ground. So, so that's my bit on uh, building products. And, and now I want to talk about software security research. And it's probably going to sting slightly more for everyone in this room. Just with a show of hands, how many of you here identify as security researchers? Whether it's part-time or something you want to do. <laughs> Shut up, raise his hand. Okay, there's a few. So, so there's an interesting question here that I mentioned at the beginning, which is just why South Africa's software, why our research output is so small. And, and you could say that we are a small country that's isolated, but, but if you look historically, 
you'll see other small countries. You'll see great stuff from Argentina. Like, like the Argentinians have been doing memory corruption exploits that have surprised the world since the early 2000s. If you look at Poland, they had like the LSD team. They had Joanna Ratkowska. They heavily represented in the world. You look at the Australians. You look at the Kiwis. Like lots of small places have produced lots of great security research on the world stage. But South Africa hasn't. And, and the question that we have to ask is why? Like, why don't we? And, and like, you don't end up with too many answers other than us. Like, like for, for other things, you can blame ecosystems and you can blame lots of stuff. But, but for security research stuff, at this point, it's just us. There's no great limitations that stop us. Like, we're not doing it because we're not doing it. And again, because the topic becomes harsh to read, I'm mostly going to cheat and refer to this paper that, that I've often quoted. If any of you have not read Richard Hemming's You and Your Research, like it's awesome. I wish I was you because like reading it for the first time, it's mind blowing. And, and it's so good that, that you should periodically read it again when, whenever you can. And in, in this, uh, it was actually a talk Richard Hamming gave to a bunch of scientists. And, and he was talking to them about what makes the difference between scientists who do great work, he calls it first class work, and scientists who don't. And, and the paper is amazingly good. Like he goes through a whole bunch of things motivation, work-life balance, how to succeed after you've become a success. So it's totally worth it. If, if nothing else comes out of this talk, you should go read this paper and it'll still be totally worth it. And, and one of the things that, that Hemming starts with in the paper is he says, look, you've got to start by, by admitting to yourself that you want to do great work. That, that you want to do first class research. And uh, this was already in the 80s, but, but he talks about how already people kind of shy away from saying they want to do that. Like people are slightly embarrassed to say, you know, actually I want to present at Black Hat. And there's no reason to be ashamed of it, right? Like, like a few years ago, I worked with Dominic from SensePost and, and very early on, we were talking about, he was slightly embarrassed to say, like, he enjoyed the rush he gets talking at a, at a public conference. And that's nothing to be embarrassed by. Like, people like being recognized by their peers. And one of the things is just to admit that that's what you want, and then you work for that thing. Like, like there's nothing wrong with wanting really smart people to think that you're smart. Wanting to speak at Black Hat is, is cool. Like it's it's changed lots of the trajectory of lots of people's careers, and and as a starting point, just saying, "Yep, I want to do this stuff," is is important. Um, but then Hamming gets, like again in the first few paragraphs, to a really tricky thing, where he turns around and says, "How did I do this study? Like like what made me do this study about what makes great scientists?" And and for him, he worked on the Manhattan Project, and he talks about how he's there with Hans Bert, with Fermi, with Feynman. And he says, I was there to fix computers, and I saw that I was a stooge. And of course, he's being self-deprecating, like he's invited to work on the Manhattan Project. But, but it is interesting, because almost all the goodness that comes out of his paper comes from this, from this sort of self-awareness that says there is great stuff happening. There are people doing this amazing work, but I'm not. And for one of those particularly stinging things, I'll tell you that in my experience, the South Africans have, we have a super unusual trait. Like we joke about it sometimes with, with some of the other researchers that I know, but if you talk to the average South African 
IT manager. He'll have really good advice for you on how Steve Jobs should have run Apple or how Elon Musk should run Twitter. And, and deep in his bones or her bones, he's convinced that that's the way that should go. And, and you see the same for research where you talk to lots of people who've never published research internationally, but are super convinced the only reason they haven't is because they just didn't get around to it yet. And, and in part, this really stops you from, from taking stock and going, no, actually, I want to do that thing. That thing is really hard to do. I'm going to put in the work to do that thing. Instead, it lives in this kind of vacuous space that goes like, I could do that if I had the time, or I could do that if my organization was different. And, and in a way, this lack of self-awareness is, is almost the opposite of, of what you're seeing in the, in the Hamming case. And, and again, it's this question that says, how do you rank your output, or how do you rank your research, is something that modern culture kind of frowns upon. You're not supposed to be that competitive. You're not supposed to, to look at yourself that way. But Hamming makes it clear that if you want to do first class work, it's kind of what you have to do. You have to look at people pulling it off and go, well, how did they do it? Like, what are the trade-offs they're making in their life? And, and again, it's something that it's really easy to fool yourself with. Okay, it's one of those things that every part of your mind wants to convince you that actually, you are Helva Flake. You just didn't do maths uh, in matric. And if only you did maths instead of doing what you did, you'd be Helva too. Okay, but, but for anyone who's worked with Helva or knows Helva, they know that he's been totally dedicated to his craft for 20 years. And, and the reason he's Helva is because of that. And the reason I'm not is because I'm not. <coughs> so Hemming starts and goes, okay, you've got to do this. And, and then he talks about luck. So, so in this topic of, of how much does luck play a part in, in whether you do great work or not? And, and I'll come back to this in a little bit. But to this question that says, if you deep down believe that you are a quality researcher, one of the questions you should be asking yourself is just why you haven't published good research yet. And again, like you always have really good reasons for it. Okay, there's, there's always stuff, and, and inside you know you're capable of it, but you just haven't. And again, it ties in to the earlier topic that says, we start getting really comfortable just consuming security research. A few years ago, more than a few years ago now, because we're old, we, we started uh, ZACon uh, in Gauteng, and we had this huge fight slash discussion on whether we should do badge hacking or any of the other conference entertainment stuff that happens around security conferences. And I was totally against it, and, and I was horribly overruled, and I still think I was right. But for the most part, you see even security conferences today very quickly veer down towards contertainment. You go to the conference, you do add some LEDs to a badge, you learn how to become a DJ, you do stuff like that. Okay, and <coughs> I didn't want it for ZACon because I felt it was disrespectful to the speakers. Like somebody worked months to put a talk together and instead of listening to the speaker, you're now sitting there trying to put LEDs on. And I buy the argument that, that for some people it introduces them to electronics. But you start to see almost everything push us towards pure consumerism. And, and even conferences become like that, where it's actually a quick shot of work, people go in, they attend it, they had a nice time, and they go home. And yeah, it's, it's one of those things that you're just gonna have to change if you wanna do quality research. And whenever people discuss why they haven't done uh, research, you'll start to see people say they didn't have the time, they didn't have org support, and, and for no time, like that's an easy one to kill, right? Halvar doesn't have more hours in his day. Um, 
Tavisso doesn't have more hours in his day. He's just making different trade-offs than we are. And, and again, the simple thing becomes, do you want to do this? If you want to do this, you need to understand the trade-offs, and then you make them or you don't. And if you do, you, you get a shot at it. Um, no org support is, is a really interesting one, and I warned you that almost all of this was just bad nostalgia. But when I was at Sense Post, uh, we met a customer and, and it was a few days before we went to Black Hat. And, and this customer had a, oh, he was a CISO at a pretty cushy job in, in Kauteng. And I remember specifically, he said something like, oh, you guys are going to Black Hat, you're so lucky, my company doesn't pay. Like, and he was all insulting, like, my stupid company doesn't pay for me to go. And at the time it really bristled, because like for us to go to Black Hat, like nobody was magically paying for it. Right, like we had our day jobs, which was doing pen tests, and then to do that research, we were spending days and nights to be able to do a talk. We submit a talk, it gets accepted, and that's why we're going to Black Hat. And he could have done that. Like, like our org didn't give us any more support than his org did. And at the time, his Facebook was filled with weekends where he spent four by fouring, and and. Like at the time, I felt very strongly, uh, like a thing that said, yeah, like my org didn't allow this to happen. I gave up quality family time to make this happen. You can too. Um, and, and then a, a better example of this came up. If Have any of you read the book Skunk Works? So that's something else that's cool if, if you take away. There's, there's a book by... So firstly, if, if you work in an org and they talk about doing skunk works, skunk works was originally based on an actual skunk works division that Lockheed Martin did. And the second person to run skunk works, a guy called Ben Rich, wrote this book about how they invented stealth technology. And the book's fascinating for a whole bunch of reasons. But but one of the interesting things for this story was Ben takes over from this legend who, who made Skunk Works. And, and the guy before him who made Skunk Works had such a reputation that he'd literally tell the Air Force, I want to build a jet that uses the stars for navigation, give me N million, gets the money, makes the jet, delivers it to the Air Force. And he was a legendary pilot, legendary administrator, and he's now going to retire. And so the new guy taking over has to follow in those footsteps, and, and that's near impossible. And so the new guy steps in, and he pulls out this old research paper on stealth technology, and they start putting together what, what eventually becomes the Nighthawk and modern-day stealth. But, but there's a really interesting thing where they build it, they invent it. It's, it's completely impossible at the time, right? Like with the technology, they've... They've shrunk down the radar cross-section of a jet to the size of a golf ball. Like, completely unheard of. They've presented it to the Air Force, and they now get the contract to build these things. And, and there's a snippet of the book, I've actually got that snippet up in that blog post, where the U.S. government is now on top of them when they're making the stuff. And the government's on top of them in the sort of way that you expect a draconian, Kafka-esque, bureaucracy. It's like they find them for their workspaces not being clean enough. They find them for using the wrong materials. And, and it's really counterintuitive because you kind of think that these people who are doing skunk works, building generations ahead aircraft, would have this free hand to do cool stuff. But it's actually completely the opposite. They have to fight for every dime that they get. They have to justify every decision that they get. And you start to realize that if you're working at an org where you think they don't give you the freedom to innovate, they didn't innovate at Skunk Works because they had a free hand. They innovated at Skunk Works despite the fact that they didn't have a free hand. And if you're not building your stealth, it's probably not because your org is restricting you it's probably because you're not Ben Rich. And I give this example of Tavisso. Um, 
all of you, uh, show of hands, anyone doesn't know Tevis Hill? Okay, so, so Tevis is a pretty famous researcher who works for Google Project Zero. If, if there's anything that's vulnerable, chances are someone in the world has exploited it, and chances are that someone is Tevis Hill. Jokes aside, like, early on hacked the PSP, really a skillful code auditor. His, his hack on the PSP was actually the same hack that was then used by people on the iPhone. So, so the early iPhone jailbreaks used, used his hacks. But one of the interesting things, if you look at Tavisol's stuff, I'm going to break my slides to do this, but let's see. And that totally doesn't work because who knows how that works. Uh, drag it the other way. So this is Tavis's homepage. And what you'll see here is just a list of bugs that Tavis had found before joining Google Project Zero. Okay, and this was all completely in his spare time. Like this was just Tavis doing what Tavis does. And, and again, what's interesting is if someone looks at Tavis today, you kind of go, well, I could probably find bugs if I was working full time at Project Zero and working next to Natashenka and, and that sort of stuff. But Tavis was doing it when he was doing it for free, auditing Debian packages for fun. Okay, and actually, if we go back to this page, I'll show you something else that's interesting. If you go to the bottom, like I can't really see this. There's a port. Now I'm just going to break everything. That's fine. I if you go down here, you'll see he lists a whole bunch of crack me's, a whole bunch of hack me's. For those of you who've never done it, crack me's were the way lots of people got into early reversing. So somebody puts together an app or broken in a certain way, hey, reverse the serial. And and if you read through Tavis's comments, I included this in one of my previous talks, you get to one of them where his, he walks through his solution and his solution spans more than a year. It's like played with this, built a VM, did this. And, and again, it's one of those times when you realize that Tavis isn't Tavis because he was born with crazy off the charts alien IQ. He's Tavis because in the times when we were out or I was playing with my kid, he was doing crack me's and auditing Debian packages. And and it's totally fine if you choose not to be a Tavis. Like not everyone can. But the problem comes in when you want to be a Tavis without putting in that level of work because that's just fooling yourself. Let's see if that comes back on. It does. Um, yeah, so, so Tavis finds his stuff because he's Tavis, not because he works for P0. Ben Rich pulls the stealth, not because he works at Skunk Works, but because he's Ben Rich. And we've got to ask whether we are that person. And, and at this point, the very logical question is, what about life balance? Like, like how does life balance fit into this? Um, and, and this is a tricky one, and, and it's a tricky one especially now. And uh, I'll give you a few mixed answers on it. One, again, Hemming addresses it directly in his paper. Um, in his paper, he says, look, he had to neglect his wife some of the time. Um, doing great work requires this neglect. In, in the actual talk, there's a Q&A that happens. If you can read the talk or you can watch it on YouTube. You should actually read it. He's not that good a speaker and it takes away from it sli slightly. But in the actual video, there's a Q&A section where they delve into this question more. And he talks about the fact that, yeah, look, you can choose to have a good life or you can choose to be a Nobel winning scientist. Um, but you choosing, that's just how it is. And, and this question's come up a few times recently, in part because of the insanity around Musk and Twitter right now. So, so for those of you who don't recognize the meme, 
one of the Twitter PMs shortly after their new boss came on tweeted about how she was sleeping in the office. And and this causes a whole bunch of pain. Like I uh we have a company and we can't promote this sort of lifestyle. Like if we did this, we'd kill everyone working for us and nobody would work for us. And and fortunately until fairly recently, this used to cause me a bunch of uh, consternation because in my young days, like I've written bunches of internal blog posts on how you only get goodness burning the candle at both ends. Like, like I used to be hardcore for you only get goodness by working yourself to death. And at some point building things, we had to say, look, if you want to build a sustainable company, you can't build something like that. And so we don't like we have reasonable working times and lots of leave and all of that, or we try to. And for me, it was still hard to reconcile because I still believe that this is true. I've never seen great researchers who don't skew heavily towards workaholism when it comes to doing good research. And, and for a while, I couldn't figure what that was. But fortunately, there's a loophole. Because building products for your company is not the same as doing security research that either becomes Nobel Prize winning work or Black Hat conference work. One of them is something that you do, and hopefully you do it well, and hopefully you find a way that's sustainable. But if you want to do great world-class research, that's not the same thing. And if you're lucky, you find an org that sustains both of them. The org will support you. It'll let you do your stuff. But if you ever think it's not going to take mind-bending work, you're lying to yourself, and it's probably not going to work out too well for you. So really quickly, I'm actually not sure of my time, some, some quick pointers. One, go read Hemming. Totally worth it. It'll change your life. Two, straight from his paper, you need to periodically ask yourself whether you're working on interesting stuff, like, like whether you're working on stuff that's meaningful. In the paper, Hemming takes this to an extreme where he, he meets people for lunch and asks them, like, what's the most interesting problems in your field and why aren't you working on them? And he talks about how he stops getting invited to some tables after those conversations. But it is interesting because we do the same thing in InfoSec. There are people who, who call themselves researchers, who want to do research. And if you ask them, well, what, what are you working on right now? What's the interesting space you're looking into? And you find they're not. Um, and you can't possibly move forward or make great strides unless you're actually choosing areas that matter. One of the big things to avoid are the easy dopamine hits. Um, and, and you see these all over the show. You see them for conference talks. Um, we try to encourage young folks at the company to give talks to start uh, building their muscle with doing research and giving talks. And, and it's really interesting to see how many times young folks will, will give a talk and just scratch the surface of that talk. So, so they're looking into a topic, and the stuff that they put together on the topic is the stuff that you could learn with an hour of research on the internet. Like, like you could Google, you could do it. And you see this a lot at local conferences. Someone says, okay, there's a hot new topic on distributed apps. Like, I'm going to do a talk on dApps. And the talk will start about why Bitcoin is good and why Satoshi did this and how it's being used in Ecuador. And all of that stuff doesn't give them a deeper understanding of how the technology works. And at the end of the day, they get off the stage and they're now happy because they've given a talk, but they haven't fundamentally learned the technology. They've not gotten any deeper with that topic. And instead, what happens is you get this mini dopamine hit of being a speaker at a conference. And you walk away and now you're a speaker and you've got a speaker badge. And this starts to happen so much that like, I'm starting to kick back against people who say they want to be a speaker. Like, being a speaker isn't a thing. Like, like if you want to be a researcher, that's something. Like, do the research. But, but wanting to speak, 
is pretty empty. Um, <laughs> learn the trade, not the trick. So for years we did this. We gave classes at Sense Post on how to break into things. And we spent a lot of time telling people that they needed to go deeper on everything they did. And especially if you're interested in doing security research, stopping at the trick gives you such a le surface level understanding of things. And, and you can spot those people who just constantly go deeper, who take whatever they're looking at down to first principles to say, this is how this thing fundamentally works. Because the jump from that to how do I break it or how do I abuse it is, is much, much smaller. Um, I promise I'm almost done. The internet allows you to hang out with anyone. Um, so there's an apocryphal quote about how you're the average of the five people you interact with most. But it's super interesting that you have the internet, which means you can hang out with anyone, and most of us hang out with the same people we always have. And, and this is not me saying you should kick out your friends or kick out your besties. But it is saying you should choose the people you spend time with and the people you emulate better. If, if you want to be a security researcher, and if you are following Halva and Dino and Tavaso, one of the things that you'll pick up is their discipline as it comes down to research time, project time, work time. And it's really easy to miss that stuff if you're following them and also happen to be following a bunch of comedians. But yeah, the internet allows you to pick your, your five people well. You should use it smartly. Um, almost the last slide, make more stuff. With a quick show of hands, how many of you here have tweeted in the last month? People are currently nervous. How many of you have posted something on a blog? There's quite a few bloggers. It's interesting. Any of you built and released software? Shulof, you don't count. Punch cards don't count. Um, um, no, so, so part of the reason why it's interesting is because if you put out anything, you start to see the value in building stuff, releasing stuff, getting feedback on it. And if, if you're blogging, for example, and it's, it's really, if you think about it, it shouldn't be that hard, you start to become appreciative of 300 people who read your blog. Like a thousand people read your blog, and it's like, holy shit, a thousand people just did this. And, and the problem is, when you don't produce stuff, those things skew. So, so you see someone release an app online, and they get 10,000 users, and you know that's not enough. But if you wrote a blog post and got 300 readers, you'd celebrate. If you got 1,000 readers, you'd celebrate. And that's part of the thing that comes from just making stuff. It, it changes the way you think about it. And the thing to note when you're building stuff is that it will suck. So if you haven't seen this on back, because it's really worth it, if you haven't seen this video, uh, Ira Glass put out this video on making stuff and, and why it's hard and it's super worth it. And currently you can hear it from my Mac speakers. Let me try again. Nobody uh, tells people who are beginners. And I really wish somebody had told this to me, is that uh, all of us who do creative work, like, you know, we get into it. We get into it because we have good taste. But it's like there's a gap. That for the first couple of years that you're making stuff, what you're making isn't so good, okay? It's not that great. It's trying to be good. It has ambition to be good, but it's not quite that good. But your taste, the thing that got you into the game, your, your taste is still killer. Your taste is good enough that you can tell. What you're making is kind of a disappointment to you. You know what I mean? A lot of people never get past that phase. A lot of people are done when they get it. And the thing I would just like say to you with all my heart is that most everybody I know who does interesting creative work, they went through a phase of years 
where it had really good taste, they could tell what they were making wasn't as good as they wanted it to be, they knew it was going short, didn't have this special thing that we wanted to have. And the thing I would say to you is everybody goes through that. If you go through it, if you're going through it right now, if you're just getting out of that phase, you've got to know it's totally normal. The most important possible thing you could do is do a lot of work. Do a huge volume of work. Put yourself on deadlines so that every week or every month you know you're going to finish one story. Because it's only by actually going through a volume of work that you're actually going to catch up and close that gap. And your the work you're making will be as good as your ambitions. In my case, like it took longer to figure out how to do this than anybody I've ever met. It takes a while. It's going to take you a while. It's normal to take a while. And you just have to fight your way through that. Okay? So now there's two things. It's either Hemming's post or Ira Glass on creativity. So just to end off, again, it's totally okay if you choose not to do security research. Like, it's, it's fine. Like, it's totally your call. The main thing I want to avoid is, is where we identify as re researchers. We say we want to do it, and, and we don't put in the work behind it. I guess just to end off the question of is it worth it, like like if we're saying it affects your life, all of this stuff, I can tell you personally, for me, it's been amazing. And I can also tell you that in some ways, uh, uh, we put out this product called Canary Tokens for, for some of you who, who might not know it, for those of you who don't. And one of the interesting things about Canary Tokens is that fundamentally version one is crazy simple to do. Like, like when we built version one, it's a weekend project. Create something random, save it in a database. If someone comes along, or give that random thing to someone, and later on say, I gave it to this person. Literally, you could build it in a weekend. But we built this version one of Canary Tokens, and then smarter people in the company added on to it. And then shortly thereafter, you started to get people saying, hey, this stuff saved me. Hey, I didn't know that we were under attack. And shortly after that, you had people from Cruise Automation doing talks on how they were deploying Canary Tokens at scale, or Colin Mulliner, who's done amazing research over the years, talking about how he was using tokens to detect reverse engineering. And Canary Tokens are so simple that anyone could have done it. Like literally, if you learned programming today, you could build version one of Canary Tokens this weekend. But we did it, and we put it out there, and people built around it, and good stuff happened. And, and last year in December, like Canary Tokens was used over four million times. And, and for us, as people putting stuff out there, it's incredibly helpful. We don't charge for Canary tokens, but like if young engineers want to join the company, we get to say to them, hey, you can work on X, or you can work on this thing that Colin Mulliner said was cool, or this thing that last year 4 million people used, and it becomes a no-brainer. And, and again, it's just because we did it. And, and mainly that's my push, is you should just do it. And, and again, Hemming talks about it, and he says if you keep doing stuff, sooner or later you'll do good stuff and and like we built tokens but it comes after years and years of putting out stuff that probably nobody else ever looked at so the question is it worth it for us we've built lifelong friends we've built careers totally worth it it's hard but worth it in summary you should build more stuff you should be kinder to people who are building stuff um, you should hold yourself to a harder account. Like, there's no reason we can't be Tavisos. There's no reason we can't build great companies. Um, we just need to actually knuckle down and do it. Harun Mir on Twitter, so you can tell me there why I suck, or I think I've got a few moments for questions. I do. But thank you very much.
have to repeat the question, but it starts with someone having a question. Charles is going to have a question. Yeah. So, so to repeat the question, what do you think of the relative value of security research? Given that South Africa has a bunch of problems, why should, and given that doing security research has costs, why spend it on X and not Y? Um, I don't have a good answer to it. I think Ben Horowitz, when asked about how kids should choose their career, um, he says, don't follow your passion. Follow the intersection of what you can do, what you can do well, and where there's a need. And, and so, for example, I think I would make terrible plumber. Um, I think if, if like, the choice was plumbing or solving something computer geekery, I'm better aimed at that. And, and so I think it kind of becomes something like that, which is you choose the intersection of your talent and your interests and where there's a need. And there also happens to be a need here. Like, like for us in South Africa, I think software is, aside from security research, I, I think building software companies is hugely potentially valuable. I think like if you look at, you look at the outliers, you look at the big US companies, we can build those companies. Like there's no reason why we can't. Like we have the same grads coming out. We've got the same skills. There's no reason. And, and the economy needs it. The country needs it. So, so I think you can, yeah. I think there's, there's value in it, but I think it has a cost. How you weigh it against other costs, I, I don't know a good answer to. Um, anyone else? We've got to cut it, or Christo's going to cut my neck off. I'm not sure what that means. Thank you very much, folks.